Thanks for joining me today for this episode of the Cranky Old Filmmaker Podcast. And today, I'm smoking mad, talking my favorite skeezy subject, cannabis. No sillies, not what you're thinking. I'm not talking about smoking it. I'd love that. What I want to talk about today is the business of pot. And in this particular case, why you shouldn't call yourself a goat right out of the gate when you're doing anything, but also that referring to yourself as the apple of weed might be bigger shoes than any one nascent business can fill. My name is Deborah Borchardt. I'm the co-founder and executive editor of Green Mark Report. It is the Cannabis Financial News website that I co-founded in 2017. So today, we're going to talk about the story of cannabis company MedMen and their downfall and how it's burning my cranky old filmmaker fingers like that last hit out of the roach you just can't let go to waste. And I promise, no more puns about how you could have smelled this coming from a mile away. Well, it's interesting because MedMen actually didn't start out as a dispensary company. They started out as an investment company. And so they were raising money to invest in cannabis companies. So to get the in-depth story, we went to a great source, someone who follows the business of weed every day to get a more in-depth look. And then uh, pretty quickly, they decided that they wanted to make the jump into actually uh, being in a plant touching business. And that's when they started to plan on opening dispensaries. Give us, if you would, please, a quick history of MedMen, who any weed enthusiast couldn't help but hear about constantly when they launched in 2010, the self-proclaimed apple of weed. Raised uh, quite a bit of money. Uh, bought a lot of pieces of real estate and their goal was to as you put it become the apple store of cannabis um, they also tried to tell the market that, that they were a the first cannabis unicorn which in silicon valley terms unicorn is a startup that hits a billion dollars before it goes public and they gave themselves this billion dollar valuation even though it it was kind of almost made up bad business model smoke and mirrors i I wouldn't go so far as to call it smoke and mirrors but really just i feel a lot more leaning towards embellishment um versus because because i feel like smoke and mirrors sounds a little more fraudulent and i really don't believe um that the company uh was in, in that frame of mind. I think it really was just they wanted to hype the company up and that's what they did. Pull on the thread for us a bit more here, Deborah, and tell us how this all unravels. Internal issues. Uh, the co-founders, Adam Beerman and Andrew Modlin, um, weren't exactly endearing themselves to the industry and that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. So they, they kind of came out of the gate, not really making a whole lot of friends in the industry. And then they had internal issues. They also were known to spend very heavily. And it, I would say things started to kind of come off the wheels when sales weren't as robust as they had led the market to believe that they would be. So you had that, and then you had several lawsuits. So they just really didn't make um, a lot of friends. And then they had a lot of internal problems. And they took on a lot of debt. And so it got to a point where the debt was just so enormous, and the spending was so high, and the revenues just weren't enough, that it all the wheels just basically finally came off because they just, they just got to a point where they couldn't pay their debts. Isn't everything compounded so by the fact that so much is stacked up against these cannabis companies, hindering their chances for success, making it necessary to have all cylinders firing at 100% efficiency as much of the time as possible? Um, there were a lot of rumors in New York that um, they weren't even, that they, there were rumors, and again, this is just rumors, that they were bringing in product from their California stores to the New York stores to sell, that they weren't actually even growing their own product in the state of New York, which of course was a big no-no. Um, so there were a lot of rumors like that floating around. 
Um, but the Patterson lawsuit uncovered things like that um, these two co-founders were, you know, spending money on luxury cars with custom paint jobs and homes. Um, you know, a, a therapist on staff that was making well over two hundred thousand dollars a year, just a lot of personal expenses, and so it kind of uncovered a lot of like I said, kind of bad behavior in the C-suite. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, they just were spending like drunken sailors. And in order to keep that spending up, they just kept taking on more debt to the point that the debt was more than they could service with the revenue coming in. Deborah, 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 shouldn't everyone have seen this coming before the bloodbath enveloped so many? Uh, y- y- yes. Um, I mean, when you know that they can't pay their bills, that starts to become an issue. Um, so some of the stores, um, I think MJ Biz reported that one of the stores in Chicago had literally almost no product on the shelves. Um, they were beginning to not pay vendors. And so the vendors weren't selling to them anymore. <clears throat> so they, they had less product on the shelf. There is so much of it happening within the industry with people not paying bills. And in fact, almost like a badge of honor, like, oh, we don't even pay the small guys because they'll go out of business anyway. So, so for sure, those those red flags were out there. Um, and another problem that you have with cannabis, which you mentioned about all the challenges, you can't just declare bankruptcy because it's federally illegal and all the bankruptcy courts are in the federal court system. So you can't just say, we're going to go chapter 11. It just doesn't work. Is there any coming back from such a hard fall down the mountain? As far as like something reopening in a location, it's very possible that if the license is still good, that someone swoops in and says, well, we're going to make an arrangement to use your location and your license. Um, Maybe they pay them some kind of fee. Um, But it's, it's really hard to get a lot of information in that sense. What's the snowball effect on the industry here, Deborah? the fallout? Well, there's definitely fallout. So you've got companies like Tilray that invested $150 million into MedMen. That's gone. And they haven't addressed that yet on their books. Um, they're going to have to address that in the next few quarters, I would imagine. So at some point, Tilray is going to have to tell its investors. It has been warning them, this money that we put in MedMen, likely we're not going to get it back. They've been warning them, but at some point they're going to have to actually address that in the books. So you've got that. You've got multiple hedge funds that lost money investing in them as well. Um, You've got the debt holders. The biggest debt holder that we're aware of is Gotham Green. And so I wouldn't be surprised if Gotham Green just ends up taking it over like they did with Ianthus. Although Gotham Green isn't really in the... um, operations side of the business they've been mostly in the money side um i would expect they'll probably end up taking it over like i said similar to the situation with ianthus and finally anyone learning any lessons here or is cannabis history doomed to repeat itself in the future a couple of things are happening we are seeing some of the big msos get a better handle on their debt and start to pay it down um, you can tell in the last, really the last two, three quarters, we've seen a lot more focus on that. So these companies are addressing their debt issues and starting to really make efforts to get those numbers down and into a more reasonable situation. Some of them, the numbers are so out of whack, they're, they're just never going to survive that. Um, and then there's a lot of chatter that companies like Gotham Green are predatory that they're basically predatory lenders, that they knew lending these companies this much money, they were never going to be able to pay it back. And they did it as a strategy to just get the company. Yeah, I I think you are seeing a lot more um, sensitivity to people taking on debt versus equity within the cannabis industry because they're learning that the revenue isn't, you just can't count on it the way that I think people thought they could count on it, that it was always going to be the stratospheric growth. They're finding that in the mature markets, sales start to plateau. They just start to even out. And they can be quite good, but they do start to even out and start to um, go flat a little bit and a lot less growth. So I I do feel that um, these 
pain points are going to be less going forward because they have started to learn their lesson. Deborah Borchard, thank you so much for joining us on the Cranky Old Filmmaker Podcast. Please, one more time, remind our viewers, remind our listeners once again where they can find you and follow your coverage. You can go to www.greenmarkerreport.com. All our news is free. It is all original content. Wow. I don't know about you, but when I think about all the startups I was a part of that ran well, that just didn't have enough of a runway, enough capitalization to get over the hump, and then I hear this story, oh, thanks again to Deborah Borchard and Green Market Report. And please, before you go, subscribe, like, and share, and join me next time for another fun episode of the Cranky Old Filmmaker Podcast. I'm Scott Hunter. Don't let the smile fool you. Bye for now.